This evening we're continuing our examination of the names of God, which we find sprinkled all throughout the scriptures. And by way of review, I'll remind you that we began this series by first exploring five names, which all begin with the Hebrew word El. Throughout those studies, we learned that the name Elohim points us to the plural nature and more specifically to the triune nature of God. Then we learned that the names El Shaddai and El Gibor both point us to the all-powerful nature of God. We discovered that the name El Olam points us to the everlasting provision and protection of God. And then finally we learned that the name El Elyon points us to the exalted state of our Supreme King. Well then after wrapping up our examination of those five names that begin with the word El, we then turned our attention to, to, to the proper name of God, which is translated from the four consonants Y-H-W-H. And we learned that this name, it could be rendered Yahweh or it could be rendered Jehovah. But either way, this name was designed to reveal the infinite nature of God's existence. Not only that, but we also learned that this name is the foundation for several compound names, each of which will help us to more fully understand the character and the nature of God. For example, two weeks ago, we examined the name Jehovah Jireh, and we learned that this was the name that Abraham used as he acknowledged the way in which Jehovah was not only able to perceive their needs, but he was also the God who was able to provide them with everything that they needed. Then in our study last week, we explored the meaning of the name Jehovah Rapha. During that study, we learned that this name points us to the fact that the Lord is our great physician. And not only that, but we also considered how the Lord has promised to heal every person who trusts in him through the transformation that will occur in the resurrection. Well, now here in our study tonight, we're going to look at the next compound name on our list, which is found in the book of Exodus. And so if you would, let's open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 17, where we find Moses. He's now referring to the Lord as Jehovah Nisi. Now, as you make your way to Exodus 17, it'll help you to know that it's here in this chapter where we find Moses. He's leading the people of Israel in a battle against the armies of Amalek. It's also interesting to note here that Amalek was the grandson of Esau, and he also was the man who started the Arabian tribe known as the Amalekites. Well, with this background in mind, if you would look with me there at Exodus chapter 17, I want to begin reading at verse 8. There Moses writes, Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took up a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now here in these verses we find the Lord, he's helping the Israelites to defeat their Arabian enemies. And, and if you've read through this passage, and I'm sure that you have, I'm guessing that maybe you've stopped to wonder, what's the big deal with the rod here? I mean, you know, Moses here is lifting up this rod, and, and, and they're winning, and then he lowers the rod, and they start losing. Have you ever stopped to wonder about the connection between this raised rod of God and the military victory of these Israelites? If not, then let's think about it here, because here we find the Lord, he's willing to help these Israelites prevail against the Amalekites, but only when Moses raises this shepherd's staff up into the heavens. Why is that? Well, in order to understand the significance of this raised rod, let's continue to make our way through the final verses of this chapter. If you would look with me, beginning there at verse 14, because there we learn that the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. 
Now, here in these verses, we find Moses. He's now building this altar unto the Lord in order to commemorate their victory over the Amalekites. And he names this altar, the Lord is my banner, which stems from the Hebrew words, Jehovah Nisi. He calls it Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. And as we consider this compound name here, it'll help us to understand that the Hebrew word Nisi, it's translated here, banner, but it's a word that was used to refer to a military flag or a military standard which would be lifted up with a pole. And, and this was not only designed to act as a rally point for soldiers, but this flag or this banner was also designed to function as a source of inspiration for those who were fighting in the battle. They would be able to look and see, hey, their banner is still raised up. They haven't been defeated. Keep fighting. One example of this can be seen in the lyrics of that American classic, The Star-Spangled Banner. It's in the first stanza of the song that the lyricist Francis Scott Key tells us that the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. As this battle is going on, the, the soldiers were looking and seeing, hey, our flag is still flying. Let's keep fighting. Then in the next two lines of this song, he, the, the, the writer rejoices over the sight of our nation's flag by declaring this. He says, oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave. He's acknowledging the banner, the, the American flag. It's still waving, and therefore he says that it's waving over the land of the free and the home of the brave. It brought him great courage. It, it brought him great comfort to know that our flag was still flying. The banner of America was still there, and so they hadn't lost the fight. From this, we can see how the, the banner, the, the, the flag of an army, it's a source of courage. It's a source of courage for those American troops who were fighting there on that battlefield, and in similar fashion, the Israelites gained great strength as, as they saw Moses staying on top of that mountain with the rod of God lifted up to the heavens. But now it's important for me to point out here that this shepherd's staff, it had no flowing flag attached to it. There was no flag waving there in the wind. No, instead, here in this text, we find Moses saying, the Lord is the banner. The Lord is that flag that's flying, that's waving in the wind. The Lord himself was the banner that gave the men of Israel the courage that they needed to fight against these Amalekites. The Lord was the spiritual standard that provided his people with the strength that they needed to defeat their Arabian enemies. Now, in order to further grasp how this rod encouraged the people of God with this invisible banner, if you will, I want to take a moment to consider a few of the ways that the Lord already used this simple staff that was in the hand of Moses. With that, if you would, let's turn back to Exodus chapter 9, because there we find the Lord. He's using the staff that was in Moses' hand in a miraculous way. Look with me there at Exodus chapter 9. We're going to begin reading at verse 22. There we learn that the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the heaven, that there may be hail in the land of Egypt, on man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched out his rod toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire darted to the ground, and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt, so there was hail and fire mingled with the hail, so very heavy that there was none like it in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail." Now here in these verses we find the Lord, he's directing Moses to stretch out his hand, and by that he means stretch out the rod that's in his hand towards heaven. He's saying, hey, take that rod and lift it up towards heaven, and as he, as he did, the power of God became, began to come down, and it resulted in, in a great punishment upon the unrepentant people there in Egypt. But that's not the only time that something like this occurred. If you would, let's move forward to Exodus chapter 10. I want you to look with me there at, at verse 12, because there we read, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land. 
all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his rod over the land of Egypt, and the Lord brought an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts, and the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. Previously, there had been no such locusts as they, nor shall there be such after them. For they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was darkened, and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. Now here again, we find the Lord, he's directing Moses to stretch out his hand, and by that he means to stretch out the rod that's in his hand over the land of Egypt. And as Moses stretched out that rod, the Lord caused this plague of locusts to just devour everything that was left. Now as I consider this, I can't help but to imagine that the Israelites were beginning to see a connection here between the rod that was in the hand of Moses and the power of God. Chances are they were beginning to think, man, there's, there's something to that rod and the way that God wants to work uh, through our leader Moses. We find another example of this here in Exodus chapter 14. If you would turn forward a few, a few chapters to Exodus 14. Because here we find the Israelites, they're now fleeing from the Egyptian army. And as they found themselves trapped between the advancing Egyptian army and, and the waters of the Red Sea, the Lord once again decided to reveal his power through the rod that was in Moses' hand. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me there at Exodus 14, we're going to begin reading at verse 13. There we learn that Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Here in these verses, we find the Lord. He's directing Moses now to take that rod that was in his hand and lift it up over the Red Sea. And as he did, the Lord divided the waters of the Red Sea so that the people could cross over on dry land. As you probably already know, well, the Egyptians were close behind and they decided to follow the Israelites across this temporary land bridge but the Lord didn't let them arrive safely to the other side. Now, the Lord actually caused the waters to come and drown them right there in the Red Sea. Now at this point in time, the Israelites, uh, they no doubt could clearly see how the Lord was using this wooden staff in the hand of Moses to accomplish incredible miracles. And as he stood there on the, on the shore of the Red Sea and, and with the rod lifted up over this water, and as this water begins to divide, all of the Israelites passed by and saw it. No doubt that they were beginning to recognize that God was working miracles through the obedience of Moses, but also through this powerful rod. Finally, I want to remind you of the way in which the Lord used this rod to produce for them water from a rock. And with this as our focus, let's make our way now back to Exodus chapter 17, because there we find the details of this incredible miracle. If you would look with me there at Exodus 17, now I want to, I want to look back at the first several verses of this chapter. Let's begin there at verse 1. There Moses writes, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandments of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, why is it you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb. 
and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now here in these verses we find the Lord, he's directing Moses to use his rod to strike this rock there in Horeb. And as he did, water flowed out of that rock so that all the people of God and all of their livestock could drink and not die of thirst. By that point in time, there's no doubt that the people of God were associating Moses' rod with the power of God. Therefore, when they saw Moses during the battle with the Amalekites, standing atop that mountain, holding up this this rod that God had used so many times to produce these incredible miracles, I can't help but to wonder if they looked up and saw some sort of banner, the power of God flowing off of this rod. I wonder if they saw something like a shining flag of God's glory waving in the wind attached to this miraculous rod. Though the wooden staff was missing a material flag for this military campaign, Moses was sure to remind the people that the Lord was their banner. And he did that by declaring, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. He's saying the Lord is our flag. The Lord is our standard. The Lord is our banner. And listen, not only did Moses refer to the Lord as their banner, but so did the prophet Isaiah. The the prophet Isaiah actually refers to the Messiah as our banner. But this is our focus. If you would, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Because it's in Isaiah 11 where we find the prophet Isaiah. He's writing about the millennial reign of the promised Messiah. And I would encourage you to read the entire chapter for homework because there's some wonderful descriptive you know, uh, uh, pictures of the millennial reign here in this text. But it's after he described the peace that will fill the earth during this period of time that Isaiah then goes on to describe the banner of this kingdom. And much like Moses, Isaiah tells us that the Lord himself is going to be our banner. The Lord himself will be the flag of his own kingdom. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me there at Isaiah 11, we're going to begin reading at verse 10. There Isaiah declares, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. For the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left from Assyria and Egypt from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Here in these verses, the prophet Isaiah tells us there's coming a day when the root of Jesse, the offspring of Jesse, will stand as a banner to the people. According to Paul, well, he's talking about Jesus. Paul tells us in Romans 15, verse 12, that Jesus is the root of Jesse, and he's quoting Isaiah 11, 10 here, and he's telling us that Jesus is the one that Isaiah was pointing to. Therefore, Jesus is not only the son of Jesse, but Jesus is the banner who was raised up there in the final days. In order to understand what this means, I'd like you to turn to John chapter 12. You see, it's in John chapter 12 where we find the Lord. He's now describing his own death in a way that's comparable to the raising up of a banner. And much like a military banner was used to draw soldiers to the same rally point, well, Jesus is the banner. And through Jesus, our banner all men will be drawn to him. With this in mind, look with me there at John chapter 12. I want to begin reading at verse 31. There Jesus declares, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said signifying by what death he would die. Now, here in these verses, we find Jesus, he's comparing his death uh, there on, on the cross to that of being lifted up. 
He's saying, hey, if, if I'm lifted up, and, and that's kind of like a, a banner being lifted up on a pole. You see, much like a banner is lifted up on a wooden pole in order to draw soldiers to a unified rally point, so too Jesus was lifted up on that wooden cross so that sinners might be drawn to him and turned into heaven's soldiers. In this way, we see then how Jesus is the physical incarnation of Jehovah Nisi because he's become the banner who was lifted up from the earth on that wooden pole, on that old rugged cross. Jesus is the banner, and all sinners are being drawn to him. Now, that doesn't mean every sinner is going to come to him. It doesn't mean everyone's going to submit themselves to this commander-in-chief. But the Lord is saying, hey, I'm going to set up this standard. I'm going to raise up this banner. If I'm crucified, if I'm lifted up in this way, I will become the rally point. I will become the standard. I will become the flag. And whoever wants to become a soldier in the Lord's army will gather to me, and I will draw them to myself. Those who rally under the banner of the promised Messiah, they're not only accepted as enlisted soldiers in the Lord's army, but our banner, Jehovah Nisi, has also promised to provide us with the power that we need to gain the victory over every evil enemy. Now, with this is our focus, I'd like you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 19. And the reason why is because it's in Revelation 19 where the Apostle John, he actually presents us with a vision about the day when the Lord will return to the earth riding a white war horse. And we should notice that the Lord isn't returning uh, as a babe in the manger. And that's oftentimes how people like to picture Jesus. Uh, oh, the babe in the manger. Sweet Jesus, meek and mild, but never hurt anybody. You, you, you see the bumper stickers. Who would Jesus bomb? You know, that people, people like to imagine Jesus as being this, this timid, you know, this timid Savior who, who had only came to save and, and would never, ever judge anybody. And so many people would like to say, well, I like the God of the New Testament, not the God of the Old Testament. I would suggest that many of these people haven't made it to the book of Revelation yet. Because when you read through the book of Revelation, what you end up discovering is that the God of the New Testament is very much like the God of the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, if you would look with me there at Revelation chapter 19, I want to begin reading at verse 11, because there John writes, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now here in these verses, John tells us about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And while we tend to think about Jesus, the sweet Savior who, who came to die for the sins of the world, as we think about the, the, the sweet Savior who, who rode that, that baby donkey uh, to the temple, here we find the Lord Jesus Christ. He's no longer clothed in, in, in tattered robes. He's, he's no longer riding a baby donkey. No, he's got crowns on his head and his robe is dipped in blood, and he's on this white war horse. And he's coming to judge the nations of men. You see, when Jesus returns, he's coming to wage war against those who chose to be his enemy. Now, it's interesting to note, if you're a born-again believer here tonight, that you, like myself, are actually found here in this prophecy. You might not have known that, but we're here in this prophecy. In order to prove my point, look with me again there at verse 14, because there John tells us that the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. I love that. We're in our brand new bodies. We've been cleansed from the stains of this world. 
were clothed in fine linen and were on, on these white horses following our commander-in-chief back down here to wage war against the Lord's enemies. That's us right there in Scripture, Christian. If you're a believer, then you're in the Bible right there. The armies of heaven following the Lord. That being the case, listen, every redeemed believer is going to return with our commander-in-chief on that day when he initiates this military campaign against the unrepentant people of this world. And to me, that's exciting. It's exciting to imagine returning with the Lord, taking up arms with our Savior, and watching him secure the victory for us. You see, much like those Israelites who fought against the Amalekites, I believe that Jehovah Nisi is going to give us the victory over every evil enemy because those who gather under the Lord, our banner, have become more than conquer, conquerors through our Savior, Christ Jesus. He's going to hand us the victory. It's a done deal. Therefore, when you hear the name Jehovah Nisi, I would encourage you to let it be a reminder that those who are in Christ Jesus, those who have gathered to the banner, Jesus Christ, well, we're already on the winning team. We're already following the commander-in-chief who will always be victorious in battle. And as we gather under this standard, as we gather together under the banner, Jesus Christ, we can know that we'll be victorious forevermore. You see, after the Lord gains the victory over every enemy and he makes every enemy his footstool, it's not like there's gonna be a day some, some, sometime millions of years in eternity future that a greater military will come along with, with a better standard and, and, a, and a more beautifully decorated flag and claim victory over our commander-in-chief. It'll never happen. When we gather together under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ, we join the winning team and we'll always be victorious. We'll always be more than conquerors in the Lord. So don't fear men. What can men do to us? Kill this fallen body? If the Lord is your banner, then rejoice in knowing that you will always be victorious in the Lord.